Hello, reading friend. Thanks for joining me for another book chat. Today, let's spend some time with the Pickwick Papers by Charles Dickens. This book was originally published in book form back in 1837, and it appeared first, though, in a serialized format, I think in the previous year, 1836. So I listened to a 2018 Audible edition that was narrated excellently, by the way, by Rory Kinnear. So when this was published back in 1837, I was sort of reading up on it. It was a publishing sensation, and Charles Dickens was sort of a literary um, superstar at that point all across the English-speaking world. This was really kind of the first big kind of blockbuster um, book from what I can read. What we you know today would be like an a, a international kind of best or at least among in the English-speaking world, from what I could read up on its history. So it was very popular at the time. It sparked its own sort of Pickwick clubs around England and elsewhere and all sorts of other sorts of um, activities fan the fandom took around this book at the time when it was published. And here we are, you know, getting up on close to 200 years later, and it's still a pretty popular book. It's still very funny to read and very entertaining. I have read this before. I read this back in the late 1990s. I read through all of the Dickens novels except for one. I think I did not read at the time. I think it was Hard Times. But I read this. I didn't remember a lot about it. And then a while back, I watched the uh, BBC uh, adaptation series, adaptation of this uh, book uh, from like 1985, I think, the middle of the 80s. And I thought it was so fun. I thought, you know, I really would like to read that again and see um, and, and just sort of experience it in reading a format again. And I'm really glad I did because I was highly entertained um, with this group of gentlemen that form the the Pickwick Club and write the Pickwick Papers. So what it's about basically is this group of friends um, led by Mr. Pickwick, who is an uh, kind of, I, I got the impression he's kind of an early retirement age, right? He's retired from business. He's, he's a wealthy, was a wealthy, successful business person. Um, and then he has two, uh, three, these three friends that uh, really uh, go on these adventures with him in the Pickwick Club. Pickwick Club. The Pickwick Club exists really to observe and document humanity and the actions of humans. So they're very interested in humans, but in humanity. Um, and you know, but they really the the funny part about it is they're so eccentric themselves. They don't really know understand reality reality as such uh, because they live in their own sort of little eccentric little worlds and I'll talk more about that here here later in the chat but Mr. Pickwick is sort of I guess the leader the club is named after him um, the papers so part of the book is structured in that like we're we're looking back in time we're reading through the papers of the Pickwick Club because what they will do is they will go on some sort of adventure or they will interview someone really interesting and then they'll write a paper about it and present it to the Pickwick Club. So part, part of our experience is, as a reader is about, I think it's about 10 years after the events that are, that are portrayed in the book. Uh, we're sort of uh, reading through, somebody is, is, is reading through the, the papers of the Pickwick Club and, and telling us about them. So that's sort of how it's structured. But the other friends, so we have Mr. Pickwick, Samuel Pickwick. Um, Nathaniel uh, Winkle is a young man. He is known as a sportsman, or they think of him as a sportsman, and he thinks of himself as a sportsman. But then we, the reader, you know, we get to see, like, anytime he's around a horse, he doesn't know how to handle a horse. He doesn't know how to manage a gun. He almost shoots people, uh, It's you know, on several occasions. But the, the Pickwickians, nevertheless, less consider him a sportsman. Augustus Snodgrass is another one of the younger Pickwickians, and he is known as a poet. They think of him as a poet, and he sort of thinks of himself as a poet. They will defer to him about poetry, but yet he's never, there's never any of his poetry really um, 
in the book. I don't. It's not even known if he's ever even written any poetry, but nevertheless, he considers himself poetic. And then Tracy Tupman is a middle-aged, sort of chubby, middle-aged uh, man, bachelor. These are all bachelors as the novel opens, um, but who considers himself nevertheless quite a romantic uh, lover. So he feels himself quite a success with the ladies, but then you know, we see um, that's not necessarily the case. He does get a love interest at one point. It doesn't work out quite as he had hoped um, to the great, uh, you know, to the great comic relief of all of us who are reading about it because it's pretty funny. But, you know, Mr. Pickwick as well uh, often gets into these situations where and Mr. Pick, Pickwick and the Pickwickians get into these situations throughout the book as they go on these different adventures. Um, really, not really adventures, but more like expeditions. They'll go visit someone, you know, that they meet. They'll go to some sort of other town. Um, they'll they'll meet someone in maybe a tavern or an inn that's got an interesting story to tell, and we'll, then we'll hear that story. And so it sort of sketches like that. It's sort of episodic and it's just sort of. Um, and, and then they'll the Pickwickians will all be really excited to hear this, you know, this stranger's tale. Um, but, um, yeah, but as they, as they interact with all these people, you know, we see them sort of for their eccentric selves and, um, and, and, you know, it's, it's very funny most of the time. There's a couple of other characters I did want to mention though. Um, Sam Weller is, uh, starts out as like a servant in a, in an inn and meets Mr. Pickwick. Mr. Pickwick then takes him in as his manservant. And then, uh, Sam Weller's father's named Tony Weller. He's a stage ghost driver and lives in for, fear of, in constant mortal fear of being chased down and, um, I guess captured by widows. Widows uh, seem to be, uh, he's been married uh, at least a couple of times, and I think his second wife is a widow, and uh, he's always cautioning his son, Sam, about uh, stay away from widows. <laughs> so there's that. And then there's Mr. Jingle. This is a really eccentric character. They meet at one of the inns. He's kind of a con man. He's got a really distinctive way of talking. It's really abbreviated, uh, leaves out all articles and pronouns and things like that, just very staccato uh, storytelling uh, sort of style that's very kind of fun and humorous. Although he's a bit of a con man, he has a manservant who's named Job Trotter who has this external persona of being very meek and mild, but we know we can see as the reader and the the Pickwickians learn as well that he's also quite a con man. He does go toe to toe though with Sam Weller, Mr. Uh, Mr. Pickwick's manservant, and Sam Weller is a very world wise person. So that's one of the things I wanted to mention was that the Pickwickians themselves are in this higher status, right? They're gentlemen, um, but really the wisdom in the novel is from the sort of the lower, the servant class, the lower classes. So Sam Weller is the wisdom because he understands the world. And so he's always needing to intervene on the Pickwickians' behalf because they don't really understand how the world works. But Sam does, and also his father, Tony Weller, also understands. So that's really interesting and fun as well. And then uh, Mr. Jingle and, um, and and Job Trotter, his, his manservant, recur throughout the novel. They meet them early. They have uh, different relations with them, uh, you know, very sort of... Um, uh, comical yet um, con man-ish sort of interactions with them and uh, it all sort of resolves at the end as Dickens novels tend to do. Um, so uh, the other th I mentioned kind of about some of the adventures they went on. We do see some really humorous things like they go to this lady's house and she's a, a great, supposedly a great poet and she's written this poem Ode to an ex Expiring Frog. Um, that's really pretty funny. Um, of course, they get they go there because they they think that um, you know Mr. Snodgrass is you know the poet, and so uh, you know that's a pretty pretty funny kind of little sketch there. And then we see some aspects in this novel that we see late in other Dickens novels. For, for example, there's a story about a man who um, is sort of a, a, a mis you know misanthrope who who really hates humanity and is like 
mean to kids on Christmas Eve and stuff like that. But, you know, he, he gets carried away by, I think it's in this case, it's goblins and, and really learns how to be a good person on Christmas Eve. You know, we would see that later with Dickens' A Christmas Carol. And then we also, um, some of the Pickwickians, I'll just say, without giving away spoilers, uh, we see the inside of a debtor's prison again. Uh, we see this also in Little Dorrit. So, um, one of the Pickwickians finds himself in a debtor's prison at one point in this novel for kind of humorous reasons um, and misunderstandings, again, about the misunderstanding um, the, uh, you know, humanity and not understanding kind of how the real world works. Um, one of the Pickwickians winds up in a debtor's prison. Um, okay, so uh, there's a quote from the book that I wanted to read before I run out of time. It's a very hilarious, it, to me it's one of the most hilarious passages of the book, and I think it really sort of illustrate uh, what I'm talking about with this, this Charles Dickens style, if you're not familiar with it, and sort of the humor there. It's got a 19th century type language, also, of course, obviously, since it's published in 1837 as a book, um, and then also sort of 18th century uh, 19th century manners. So the scene here is where Mr. Snodgrass is, they've gone to Mr. Wardle, uh, someone they meet on one of their adventures, invites them to his home in the country. And so they go, all the, all the Pickwickians go out to his home. He ends up having these two young daughters, as well as an unmarried, middle-aged, around 50-year-old aunt, uh, or sister, who's the aunt of his daughters, obviously. And uh, Mr. Snodgrass takes a liking to her very fast. Um, they're around the same age, and um, so they're kind of just meeting and kind of in a flirtatious period at this point. So I'll just read this quote real quick. So um, this speaking first is the, the, oh, the spinster aunt. Uh, her name is Rachel Wardle, Miss, Miss, Miss Wardle, Rachel. So Rachel says, Do you think my dear niece is pretty? whispered their affectionate aunt to Mr. Tubman. I should if their aunt wasn't here, replied the ready Pickwickian with a passionate glance. Oh, you naughty man. But really, if their complexions were a little better, don't you think they would be nice-looking girls in candlelight? Why, yes, I think they would, said Mr. Tubman with an air of indifference. Oh, you quiz. I know what you were going to say. What? inquired Mr. Tupman, who had not precisely made up his mind to say anything at all. You were going to say that Isabella stoops. I know you were. You men are such observers. Well, so she does, can't be denied. And certainly there is one thing, there is no one thing more than another that makes a girl look ugly. It is stooping. I often tell her that. When she gets a little older, she'll be quite frightful. Ah, uh, you are a quiz. Mr. Tupman had no objection to earning the reputation at so cheap a rate, so he looked very knowingly and smiled mysteriously. What a sarcastic smile, said the admiring Rachel. I declare I'm quite afraid of you. Afraid of me? Oh, you can't disguise anything from me. I know what that smile means very well. What? said Mr. Tupman, who had not the slightest notion himself. You mean, said the amiable aunt, sinking her voice still lower, you mean that you don't think Isabella's stooping is as bad as Emily's boldness. Well, she is bold. You cannot think how wretched it makes me sometimes. I'm sure I cry about it for hours. <laughs> I think that is so funny. I have laughed and laughed over that so many times. It's just hilarious. Um, anyway, I will close the Pickwick, the Pickwick Club chat with that. Uh, again, I enjoyed that so much. I've, I, I'm enjoying rereading Charles Dickens' uh, novels. I'm going to slowly reread these over the next few years anyway, a couple of years maybe, uh, but I did enjoy that. My next chat is going to be The Future of Nutrition, uh, an insider's look at the science, why we keep getting it wrong, and how to start getting it right by T. Colin Campbell, MD. I have finished this already, so I should have a chat on this coming up fairly soon. Until next time, take care.